This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Mountain Glass Arts. For the month of March, Mountain Glass is offering their borrow sale, North Star First Quality Rods at 25% off. Just put in the code North Star, that's N O R T H S T A R. And for all you soft glass nerds, they're offering their soft glass sale, double helix, 15% off. Just put in the word D helix at checkout, that's D H E L I X at checkout. Just go to mountainglass.com for any other questions, comments, or concerns. That's mountainglass.com. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. Hey, what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 87. This is Jay Michael, your host. Thank you so much for tuning in today. With 17 years of experience behind the torch, I am as excited as always to bring you conversations with artists, sharing their stories and hopes to entertain and inspire while helping you grow your business. Today is a super fun episode. We are featuring artist, glass engineer, scientist, Mike Souza. He has been a glass uh, maker, scientific glass artist since 1973. Uh, where he apprenticed under his father, a company he worked for, and now is the uh, lead glass artist at Princeton University. He's also the director of the Northeast Section of the American Scientific Glass Blowing Society, which was founded in 1952, not by himself, but that's when that organization was founded. And we get into all kind of crazy conversations from the vacuum tubes, scientific glass applications, science. I mean, it's amazing the amount of depth that we get into. It's it's really a lot of fun conversation we have uh, some of the stuff might be kind of boring and dry for you. For myself, personally, I had a lot of fun with this because I love science and math and glass. And again, we're all here for glass. And you guys will be blown away by the amount of knowledge that Mike has. Uh, not only is he a very talented glass artist and glass maker, uh, he doesn't consider himself an artist in a sense. I do because I feel that their field of scientific glass blowing. Uh, has a vision, and to me, if you have a vision and then you make it come to reality, well, then you're an artist, no matter what the hell it is you're doing. Um, but again, uh, this guy has uh, just, you'll hear all the stuff, the stories. Uh, kind of on my end, I've kind of fucked up, um, didn't realize how full my memory card was. Uh, so about 45 minutes into the conversation, my memory card stopped, and I didn't realize it until uh, 15 minutes after the fact. So we lost about 15 minutes of the conversation. It wasn't anything too crazy. Uh, but one thing that we did miss on the recording is that I learned that uh, there is a uh, laboratory, a glass laboratory, where they uh, create uh, scientific applications and, and things, apparatuses, uh, for testing uh, basically uh, atoms on a molecular structure level. And there has to be uh, completely radiation-free. And by doing this, there is a basically a mountain that has a laboratory inside of it that is uh, takes th- almost three hours to get from the entrance to where your place is because of the de- decam- decontamination process to completely rid you of any type of radioactive anything. Um, one of the things that I learned, too, was that uh, he mentioned that bananas are actually somewhat radioactive because of the potassium in there. And potassium is a molecule structure that is uh, radioactive. Uh, So even if you had a banana for lunch, you couldn't if you wanted to go work at this place. Uh, He said that basically people that leave these laboratories or leave this uh, this place uh, leave like zombies more or less because uh, of the amount of depletion they have, Um, I guess, you know, from getting all the radiation out of you. I guess it's probably a good thing in the long run, but at first, I guess it takes a while to uh, recover from but that was probably the part of the, the main part of that missing link, in a sense, for the show. Uh, so what you'll hear at one point in time, about 45 minutes in there, you'll hear a little my little satellite uh, signal, and then it just transitions into the rest of the conversation. Um, and being a scientific artist or glass maker himself, uh, we didn't get into our crash in a kiln round, but I did ask him a couple questions that were pertaining still to that round, just to kind of get some insight into his life. 
Um, we are going to be bringing him back on next month to do a Q&A, uh, debunking, myth-busting uh, topics. Uh, so if you have any questions at all that you think uh, you may not be sure if it's actually truth, uh, please send those questions into info at wiseguyradio.com. Uh, we're going to like we're going to be doing a complete uh, full myth busting uh, conversation episode, and then also we are going to be getting into the ASGS, which is the American Scientific Glass Blowing Society, uh, which is having a symposium in May that I've been invited to. Uh, it's a four day event uh, going on in Tucson. I'm uh, pretty excited to go out there. I've never been to Tucson. Uh, also looking forward to meeting all my friends and family out there that are in the glass world as well. So I uh, can't wait to do that. So in the meantime, you guys sit back, enjoy the ride. Uh, this is around two and a half hour show, I believe. Um, and again, Mike Souza, uh, guy's amazing. Uh, just, just you'll see. <laughs> and he's quite funny on top of it all. So, anyways, y'all, I'm getting the hell out of here. Gotta go get in the shower and get my ass to Disney World to go make some flower vases and some little owls I'm doing today. The wise guys are invading Disney today. I'm making some owls. It's kind of fun. And for those of you who have not listened to uh, my personal episode, uh, I think it was called What Makes Me Tick. It was my birthday episode. I got into the conversation about what the uh, what actually inspired the wise guy brand, which all started from a small little owl that I had to make for uh, like one of our guests at work at Disney. And now I still make those owls, so it's kind of fun seeing uh, the owls when they're on the shelf. So I like to say that my wise guys have now officially invaded Disney, and they will be there today. So that being said, I'm getting out of here. Y'all take it easy. I've said this already. So time for breakfast and getting the hell out. Love you guys. Y'all rock. Go to Wise Guy Radio. Actually, yeah, don't go to wiseguyradio.com. It is not up and running. I have completely taken that down. Uh, we now have wiseguymedia.com. You can go to for all episodes uh, archived or on there um, I'm still getting all the bugs out on my end and trying to figure out really how to make this WordPress thing work but for now you can go on there uh, all of our documentations that I have written uh, for you guys through the Dropbox folder on there under documents uh, you go to podcast archives you can listen to every single episode on through the website and I don't have the subscription bar on there yet, so you cannot do that. So just go there to the website, wiseguymedia.com. That's W-Y-Z-G-U-Y-M-E-D-I-A.com. And check out all the new stuff I got on there. And uh, from there, if you do need to contact me, just send me an email. That's info at wiseguyradio.com. That's W-Y-Z-G-U-Y-R-A-D-I-O.com. Love you guys. Take it easy. Enjoy this episode. Peace. Hey, Mike, how you doing today, brother? I'm doing good. Awesome, man. Well, it's an honor and a privilege to have you on here. And uh, it's kind of fun. Another glass artist in the community reached out to me uh, about you, and you contacted me. And here we are now doing the show. So I'm super excited to share your story of 40 plus years, scientific glass artist, a huge, I mean, your portfolio and your, everything you have is like 25,000 pages long. It's incredible. Uh, your academic background and just your knowledge of what you have with glass is mind blowing. And hopefully those listening to the show uh, will probably have to listen to it three or four times to really grasp all this stuff because, you know, I'd say sit back and hang on because this is going to be a fun ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, so, let me let me yeah. qualify, too. Yep. Uh, artist is is if uh, uh, in the very broadest terms, I, I d don't claim to be that. But uh, I do think if ingenuity is an art, then... Um, scientific glass blowing is uh, an art form, then. Oh yeah, I agree. I, that's what I'm saying, man. Because you're taking a medium, doing a functional application to it, but what you're doing in the head of what you have to do, like the whole engineering aspect, I think is there's art to it for sure. So, there you go. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So before we get too crazy and then sidetracked, if you want to go ahead and give us a little bit of background on yourself, where you got started, and what led you to where uh, you are now, you know, in the yeah. Well, I, I, I'm often asked that question, how did I get into scientific glass blowing? And um, my can answer is that uh, my dad uh, uh, was a shop manager in a glass shop and he had uh, five sons. So it was a form of punishment for all of us. <laughs> and I'm the one who had to do a life sentence. <laughs> but, uh, you know, um, it, it was really something I didn't want to do. Nobody wants to go to work for their dad, you know, yeah. but um, it was something that I could 
always do. And I fell into it. And as a kid, we'd go into the shop. There was seldom any glass blowing being done. And it was one summer I needed a job. And uh, I actually uh, got to see the glass blowing. And I kind of fell into the quicksand, as I say. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's actually... Yeah, and you know, I think to kind of the root of all of all of us have that root and fascination with the fire, and just you know, like I always find when I'm pulling points uh, when I'm getting my prep work done, any any demonstration or any public that I've seen that, I find I draw more of a crowd on just the process of pulling a point because you're stretching the heating, and you know, compared to if I'm making some beautiful piece of glass, but they like to see the process of glass being melted and heated up and stretching and. Yeah, there's yeah. something primordial about being around the fire. Yeah, I mean it's it's in our DNA, you know, for from the caveman period, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. So through the process with your father, uh, what was he what was he doing at the time himself? Well, he was more of a, a shop manager. He okay. wasn't a glass blower. Okay. Um, he started uh, as a grinder. So back then. Um, you had these joints, I guess, uh, they're also called gongs or something like that. And they have to match up perfectly. So they didn't have the diamond technology that they have today. Diamond was extremely expensive. Um, essentially, you would grind these tapers onto sleeves and just take this mud solution of, of carborundum and there was this big metal taper called a lap and you would just choke it onto this uh, machine spinning the lap at uh, hundreds of rpms and he was doing a real big one about a four inch one and it lopped off the fingers of uh, one of his hands holy shit yeah yeah it actually turned out to be uh, kind of a boon. He got a few thousand dollars to buy a new car. And, of course, so long as you can't be productive, they put you into management. Uh -huh. So it worked out pretty good for him. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, so so I guess you were saying you're going in there in the summer times and you started kind of helping out a little bit here and there and getting your hands dirty? Yeah, uh, I had to paint this big cyclone fence it was it was just uh oh uh, the worst job i had ever had in my life <laughs> might still be at the top of the list and uh when it rained or the weather was too bad uh i'd be inside and now i'm finally seeing uh scientific glass blowing being done for the first time and, and my first uh impression was how the heck do they see anything everything was this yellow clear yeah uh, of course because i wasn't working walking around with uh didymium glasses and um i think my dad always wanted one of his sons uh to get into the business it was one way to stay out of uh vietnam war at the time and i signed in and um, kind of quickly fell in love with it. And, and a lot of it was, at first, doing uh, the artistic stuff on the side was, was my biggest joy at the time. Huh, what kind of stuff were you doing? Oh, mostly uh, lousy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know, roses and swans and knitted ships and... Um, Anything that would impress uh, the women, yeah, um, and most especially their mothers, <laughs> um, was uh, uh, you know always worthwhile for me. And uh, I would do little fairs and set up uh, uh, a torch and make stuff. But back then we didn't have the the colors, right. So everything was pretty much formula. You made uh, the swans, and uh, there wasn't too much you could do that just didn't look empty. 
You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> there's nothing like uh, the color in glass, and and I see it today, and I and I'm almost uh, you know wish I could go back to the wayback machine and start all over again. <laughs> uh, it's just uh, just incredible artistry that I see out there. You know? Yeah, it's interesting, and that's why you know, part of bringing you on was, you know, being the shows at first. You know, I guess my niche in a sense is the pipe industry, and you know, but but glass in general, because we all love to talk about glass, and mm -hmm. to see the current industry and the way that the glass has gone from the basic cheap little pipe to now there are these amazing scientific made pieces, taking techniques that you yourself and others in your industry <coughs> have really you know been the trailblazers for, in, in a sense. And then through school and whatever else. So it's cool to see this kind of crossover going with the two industries in a sense, you know, and it's created jobs. It's created, you know, a, a income for people to raise their, and support their families with. You know, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. But like well, it absolutely. Yeah. It absolutely makes sense. And I'll tell you why. Because when I started out, there was a whole assortment of uh, things that an apprentice or, or somebody on the on the beginning end of the scale could learn how to do production wise right mm -hmm. you could make thermometers hydrometers uh all kinds of uh things on the bench and learn and your employer could make money as well right a lot of that has become automated and a lot of that has been outmoded by technology um so for the longest time I was always worried about my profession because I wondered how how would that person matriculate up to the skill levels uh, required uh, to do cutting edge stuff uh, for research and science. And as I kind of discovered uh, these young people doing pipes and functional uh, art are actually learning at a far more accelerated and created pace than I ever could in the scientific industry because when you're an apprenticeship, there's a rigid ceiling above you. Right. You're learning from somebody who, you know, wants to keep you at a pace where you can also be productive for the company. It's just the way things have to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a hierarchy. You may be better than somebody two more years advanced, but you're not going to uh, replace that person just on merit. It's a, it's a time system. And with these pipe industry, people can become their own entrepreneurs. Yep. And they have no ceiling. They also have no safety net, you know. Right. Uh, so that's a concern. But uh, they're learning, you know, basic things that I as an apprentice could never learn or never had an interest in as to cost factors. How much did the oxygen cost? How much am I paying for fuels? What do I set this price at? So... They may look a little strange or off color to some people in our industry, but I, I really respect uh, the hard work and uh, the effort that they put into it. Heck yeah. Yeah, man, I, I agree 100%, man. It's, it's the, the idea now with the way that the laws are changing and the industry is going is taking the glass artists and giving them the ability to make a living. And also, like you're saying, become an, art, art, an entrepreneur. And I consider it like this, like, I haven't coined it, but it's the whole artistic entrepreneur idea to be able to be an artist and make a living saying, yeah, I'm a, I'm a professional artist. You know, My, your parents are yeah. always like, don't be an artist for a living. But, you know, you can be if you have the skill and technique and the drive and the passion and the dedication for, I mean, yourself, the dedication you've had for 40 years doing what you're doing to which will go through to where you're at now. You know, it's 40 years is a lot of damn time to dedicate yourself to something. A lot of jobs, you can't even have a job for 40 years there anymore because they don't last that long. Yeah. You know? I, I used to be, you know, when I first started, you'd work for Ford 
or GM, and that was it. it you buy your car, your boat, and uh, you're set for life. Nowadays, if you have a, a job resume that doesn't show that you can adapt and move from one place to another, they're wondering whether you're even uh, worth hiring. Yeah. Where in, in my day, they would say, this guy is going to hop around. Uh, there's no sense in hiring him uh, for this job, you know? <laughs> and it's just totally done a 180. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, so true. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's And, and the, to be able to design your life, I mean, in a sense, is part of, again, what this show's about is having the ability, like I can get up in the morning and take my kids to school and we'll go walk my dogs and exercise and go play out my yard. And then go to the studio for five to eight hours and crank out a bunch of shit and then come home and have my family time and do that five days a week if I want to, you know, or four days a week or one day. I mean, I make a lot of money, but still the opportunity is there. We can do that. You know, it's yeah, just, I mean, it, more importantly, you can't export somebody's skill. Mm -hmm. They they're the ones who can export it. Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, and you can take that and do it in Florida. You can take it, do it in Colorado. Um, and there's a transportability to it, uh, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, it, it, there's an immediate, uh, reward system to this kind of labor. If you do sales, you'll come up and you'll make all these visits and, you know, do the best you can and, you're not going to get the return back. Uh, somebody may call with the biggest order you ever seen you and merely because they found your name in a phone book. Um, yeah. Glass blowing is, is cruel, but fair. If you put in the time, um, it pays you back and there's no eraser. You can't say <laughs> you can't erase something that you did two, three years ago. Yeah. And say, well, I, you know, I didn't do that. Uh, you know, sometimes it comes back to haunt you, you know, but it's uh, it, it's very personal. And yeah. I, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's a fun thing. Like our, our, our glass is very archivable. I mean, you know, glass over the centuries has been. But the glass, you know, like I was talking to somebody recently about the goblets that Corning has the old, old, you know, back from the uh, from Venice and stuff and. The glass is somewhat deteriorating, so they have to like put like a coating over it to keep the glass from falling apart, of some sort, you know, yeah. to preserve it. Yeah. You know, or like yeah. the glass we're doing nowadays, it's the technology has changed so much. It's like you can make a pipe, and you wonder what aliens are gonna find when they dig up through our soils and shit. Like my ex-wife, she's got her backyard's probably got fifty fucking pipes in her in her gardens that I used to dig and bury, and you know, all my old shit that I didn't like, I'd throw it in the backyard and bury it, and yeah. you know, it'll be there forever potentially until yeah. someone finds it. Yeah. You know, it's, so yeah. it's, it's pretty neat. So, yeah, yeah man. So so kind of the, your beginnings, you got into, you know, you did your apprenticeship and then you left the nest in a sense. Uh, what were some of the first things you were doing outside of that in the scientific outside, world? Outside of the scientific world? Well, no, in just the in, in the scientific world, yeah. Like, what were some of the first applications you were doing? Oh, mostly uh, a bunch of uh, test tubes that would be turned into uh, doers. Okay of different kinds um and tv necks god i hated doing tv necks it was lead glass and uh pretty thick so he'd have to use this real loud oxidizing fire a lot of oxygen and uh and it has a high thermal expansion so you got to kind of sneak up on it and not really touch it with the flame and otherwise the glass would just turn black hmm. look like heck so all i do is just one after another just heat up an end and flare it so it could be put onto uh, a new picture tube or something like that interesting uh, later on went on to do a lot of quartz work and uh, some some quite big stuff too I found that if I was in going to move at a rate that I wanted to be at or a, a level that would move me forward faster, 
I had to bounce around a lot. So I, I generally didn't keep a job for more than two years before looking elsewhere. Hmm. And I would go to one place because, uh, you know, I could learn something there. Um, grass is always greener and it, and it, it's a good way to learn different things. And the more different, the more versatility you get, the better off you'll be in the long run. Yeah, and it's been sure. a big help for me. Yeah, and I think that goes for anything too, but specifically with glass, you know, what you surround yourself in. Yeah, and especially in the scientific field because what's hot today may not be hot tomorrow, but what was hot yesterday may be hot again. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, so there's this always, uh, like, shuffle of uh, materials and technology uh, I've found in, uh, in, my, in my field. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, like, I guess, you know, it's kind of a good transition there, even though we're, I still want to continue with your, your first half of your career. But your, a paper that you wrote that uh, you shared with me, which I found was fascinating, uh, the scientific glass blowing is trending and how we can adapt. And you really got into the nitty gritty of the history of the manufacturing process for war or for the military or for the advancements of technology in a sense too. But where it went from, like you're saying, it went from in your paper, it talked about the beginning of vacuum tubes were like a big thing in the 1940s and glassware and stuff. And then eventually they got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as technology advanced to a point to where they didn't even need them anymore because they came up with this, the microchip, the microprocessor and stuff. Right. You know, so, but then they had to come back to it and they needed, again, those artists and the guys that created the tubes in a different format, but that had more of a higher skill to it. But they yeah, still, they they still had to put up. the chip, they had to put that transistor now on silicon. Uh, so that created uh, a need for all these quartz workers. Uh, I guess the, the salient point is if you are making buggy whips when, you know, that Model T comes rolling down the line, you don't necessarily lose a job. Instead, what you do is you may have to learn how to make a transmission mm -hmm. or build an engine. And there's always an opportunity to, you know, improve yourself along that line. And um, the vacuum tube was huge back in the 40s. I mean, all your televisions, radios, uh, x-rays, everything was uh, based on that uh, vacuum tube. And then, bam, uh with the technology of the transistor, it got uh, uh, displaced. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's interesting. And then, But then you fast forward to now 2016 where, you know, the, it's no longer there, but glass is in everything. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you, I mean, there are whole categories of sciences that uh, have been in, uh, you know, a mainstay now that weren't even around when I first started uh, uh, glass blowing. Uh, you know, environmental sciences. We have photonics. Um, there are uh, all kinds of uh, new things happening in chemistry. You have organic uh, electronics. Now, if you're making uh, a new material and it's a plastic that can also uh, have light properties as well as uh, conductive properties. Uh, is that chemistry? Is it material science? Is it electrical engineering? You have all this crosstalk and technology taking place like never before. Yeah. You know, and I think the point I wanted to make in my article there was if you were working in a university or in scientific glass, it was almost strictly manufacturing. You made something, you filled up the shelves, and chemistry departments around the world would order from a catalog and have it delivered. Hmm. Um, 
there are far, far less items in that catalog for chemistry. It's been reduced for several reasons, which would just bore uh, the daylights out of uh, most people. But because of uh, the facility of glass, it's now broadened out into so many uh, different sciences that at Princeton, probably it used to be 100% of the work uh, at Princeton was in the chemistry department. Now it's about 25% of the uh, work I do. Uh, now I'm uh, working quite a bit in the physics department, environmental sciences, geosciences, jet uh, propulsion, uh, material sciences. It's just uh, a very broad uh, area of uh, researches that I work with, and it's fascinating. Yeah, it's so fascinating. And that's part of the, like myself, the glass. I love the science that's involved in the, the creation of it. And then seeing, like uh, we were talking earlier, the uh, documentary that's on Netflix, uh, it's called How, How We Got to Now. And uh, yeah. the whole series, that's yeah. they have a show on glass. And it's so neat how one little idea changes the course of history. And, you know, it's, and the show talks about the glass starting in Venice and wanting clear glass, which then led into the spectacle, which led into glasses, and then microscope and telescope. And then, I mean, it goes from there. It's like, it's freaking amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you talk about a butterfly effect, and if you were to measure you know areas of civilization and say well this was the stone age this was the brass age this is the iron age uh clearly this is the uh the glass age we're living in yeah if you look at the emergence of glass from the time of uh around uh, venice uh, to where we've gotten today if if you just took a little snapshot china is so much more advanced than we are uh even the islamic nations are more advanced in their astrology and in their uh math uh but with the emergence of glass and several incredible uh discoveries uh, Western civilization just takes off and puts, and if you just took that, the last six, 700 years, you can't point to any other period of time where there's just been this rapid explosion of technology and scientific discovery. Yeah, it's my, I was, own. yeah, I would, I had a, I went to a, uh, a conference out in Cambridge and there was a great speaker there, Alan McFarland. And his whole talk was about uh, the importance of glass. And he pointed out that if you took 20 of the most uh, significant scientific discoveries, 15 of them use glass as the main material. Well, yeah. If you think about it, Newton's prison, he was able to, split light into different colors and recombine them uh, back with another prism. Um, it really caused the age of enlightenment because now you're talking uh, mm. things aren't magical or mysterious anymore. At the time, there was probably only, we looked at, uh, at matter as just earth, wind, and fire. Now... We have uh, some 160, I think, uh, elements uh, going on to the periodic table hmm. upwards. Yeah. And, and a lot of that was just through uh, glass. Yeah, it's crazy. So neat. And just this, like you're saying, just like just through that, that advances and the periodic table grows and the elements grow. And so does glass and the technology that intertwines with it, too. It's amazing. Well, if you just take uh, Robert Boyle's uh, vacuum tube, you know, the classic bell jar, okay. right? Um, and then you take uh, Priestley's experiment where uh, he takes a mouse 
and he puts in uh, a candle. They both die very quickly. Then he takes a mouse and he puts in a plant next to it. And they're able to coexist. Hmm. He was able to discover that uh, there is such a thing as oxygen. And there is photosynthesis. Now, you could have done the same experiment with uh, a box uh, out of metal and opened it up and see, well, they're still alive. Uh, But to actually observe it as it's ongoing is only something that glass can do. Right. And, And... that is just incredible. If you take the electron tube, mm. you know, until that discovery, uh, atom literally meant un- undividable. It was the smallest unit you could measure. Uh, but because of the discovery of, uh, of the uh, vacuum tube, they find electrons, subatomic particles. Now, if you take uh, a quark, a subatomic particle from an electron, and then you took one atom, and you made the atom, say, the size of the planet Earth, that one subatomic particle would be about the size of your fist compared to the planet Earth. That was considered undivisible. And now we're finding even smaller, uh, smaller particles than ever before. Hmm. So it's 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 amazing uh, what glass has enabled us to do. Yes, it is. Yeah, and I, I'm kind of curious with the future and where it's going to take. Like Google has their Google Glass stuff and all the technology with that and the <laughs> corning and their stuff. And it's really neat to see that just the where things could be merged together. You know, these ideas and masterminds get together and everybody kind of works together with, with their different areas of work, their expertise, and they come together with these amazing ideas. And then they make it come to fruition, and next thing you know, we have a cell phone in our pocket that we can't get rid of. You know? Yeah, yeah. But I, I think everything that we've done for the last century or so with the electron, uh, you know, create sound, telephone, and, and uh, so many of our incredible electronic devices – we're going to be doing with light and it'll be uh photonics Mm -hmm. uh in fact uh the early uh in uh insertion of that is fiber optics yeah look what it's done uh for uh telecommunications and we are going to probably use glass materials more so than ever you know and, and What's ironic is glass is still a mystery to us. We don't know why uh, glass forms as a glass, why it's a solid. It, it's just still uh, remains one of the most fundamental mysteries of a material uh, to science today. Does it flow over time? Well, it should, but it doesn't. And we're still trying to find out why. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it is such a weird substance. Like, I've always been fascinated by water, and then I got into glass, and it, glass acts very similar. Except, yeah. you know, they'll you know, go from a liquid to solid to a gas and back and forth, you know. And it's it, with, with glass, it's neat because you can take a solid rod and heat the shit out of it and sculpt it and manipulate it, and then you have something else that you've created. And look how lucky we are. It is the most yeah. abundant material on the planet. Yeah. Silica yeah. is the basis uh, for this. I have, it's amazing though how uh, overlooked it is. And I have people who teach at Princeton and they'll come to me, you know, as a proposal for a job and, or, something's broke and they they want to know if i can fix it and i'll ask them what kind of glass is this Mm -hmm. (laughs) and they look at me cross-eyed like there's more than one kind of glass you know and these are people at princeton and if you took 10 main ingredients and you were to shift them 
oh, a mole or so one way or the other and change the property of that glass. You could actually make a new glass every second and it would take you longer than the universe has existed to run out of different glasses Gosh. every second. Wow. That's amazing. And it's just, yeah, yeah. And when I work with, uh, you know, researchers, I really need to know what their major concern is. Is it going to be light? Uh, what spectrum of light? What, what wavelength of light? Uh, they're going to be working with? What are their temperature uh, problems? Um, glass will conduct, will become more and more conductive as you heat it up. Will the glass, will that be a factor? It's dialectic properties. Um, thermal shock, chemical resistance. Glass does not stand up to alkalize stuff like. Uh, Oh, sodium and and potassium and other materials. Well, I warn you, the only difference between me and and uh, a, a real expert is they would know when I was lying. Right. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It makes total sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's part of the fun with being at Disney. I get asked all the damn time if my kiln's a fridge. Or if I'm using argon or some kind of other gas on my torch, you know, and I'm a lot of times I just say yes, or I'll just give some kind of silly answer, but then I'll give them the real answer, you know, just kind of fuck with them, because yeah. yeah, it's it's and it's I play with the ignorance of people because people are ignorant, they don't know what's going on. It's part of my fun being there too is the educational side. So it's yeah, it's but like I know what you're saying, if they're not a glass blower, they don't have any idea. Well, it's just amazing how blank their knowledge is. It's like everybody's whittled a piece of wood. They get a, a, the idea, you saw it, you nail it. Um, glass, with all its versatility, just seems to confound and be a foreign subject to so many people. And it's just strange in my view. Yeah, you know, I, I wonder if it's because of, like, its everyday use and just about everything that we have in our life. If people have just gotten so desensitized to it and just so they just take it for granted, they don't, you know. Yeah, I'm. I mean, they're calling this the information age, right? Yeah. And and we're talking over glass for Christ's sake. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You know? uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I and I try to use like the whole everyday application. Like you drop a glass on the floor and it puts a shock wave through the glass, which causes all the molecules to go crazy. So next time you drop it, it'll probably break. You know, I try to use that for like a general generic description on why we have to anneal our glass and anneal it properly. And when I still explain it to them in the sense of I know everybody has dropped a glass on the ground that didn't break. And, they, yeah, you I, know, so I teach a fundamental course. And the way I explain it is, you know, everything heats up and when it heats up, it expands. When it co cools, it contracts. And you can. Uh, heat something up in one spot, it's always going to come against like a, a borderline where that glass did not experience the same thermal expansion. Mm. And the only way to relieve that is to get it all uh, taken out. And if you have a polariscope and you show them what strain looks like, yeah, you know, yeah, it's neat. that it's that it's permanent. And then you take another unstrained rod and you flex it and you show them, you know, the, what we call transient strain, strain that's there from a mechanical force. Uh, you can literally show them um, what that force uh, looks like, you know? Hmm, interesting. So like taking like a, like a piece of two mil rod, in, for instance, or a stringer? Yeah, a six millimeter rod, clear rod, and just flex it. And you will see it just, you know, illuminate in all this uh, color, right? Hmm. Um, and then, then what you do is you take your didymium glasses, your safety glasses, and put that on their polariscope. And you'll see that those, if they're safety glasses, they're strained like a motherfucker. Hmm. Uh, and that's because you can only break glass in one direction under tension. 
So what they do is they heat it and they cool it so that outer surface now is under compression like a Prince Rupert's drop. So when that ball bearing drops in their test, when it hits a normal piece of glass, what will happen is that impact actually makes it flex, kind of like a trampoline on the backside, right? Okay, yeah. And it gets um, uh, stiff. Now, if you bounce and that trampoline now is just tight, there's no spring to it. There's no flex then to that uh, fabric. And that's why it can take uh, the impact and not break. And it's always going to be the back side that will break, not the front side. Huh. Is it just because of like the shock wave that goes through it and then just like blows out the back in a sense? Well, you always need two things to break glass. And they always have to work in tandem. One is tension, that direction of force and you need a defect. If you apply tension to a perfectly foreign piece of glass with no defect, you cannot really break it. The, 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 the amount of force it would take is astronomical. You're talking millions of pounds per square inch. Hmm. Uh, but as soon as you put an imperfection in it, uh, that just weakens the glass. And the biggest problem is as soon as glass is made and it gets into room temperature, it starts to absorb water from the atmosphere. And as soon as that happens, you can't see it. But it's like watching this whole surface shatter. Hmm. And it goes from a million pounds uh, tensile pressure and higher to where glass generally fails at about 6,000 PSI. Hmm. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I always find, like, when I'm working, if I've I've cut myself the worst at times when a blowpipe or something had the tiniest little micro scratch in it, and it just snapped at that point. Yeah, yeah. when they make that Gorilla Glass, what they do is, and that's done through chemical tempering. It's a different process, but the most important part of that process is it gets tempered in this molten bath of potassium before it even has a chance to cool so water can be absorbed by there. Silica and oxygen is just a, is the basic ingredient, right? Mm -hmm. and, and oxygen does not like to bond that well to silica. It would much rather uh, bond with hydrogen. And what happens is as soon as you get into uh, room temperature, uh, the air, which has an abundant amount of hydrogen, as well as all these other molecules, uh, comes onto the surface, and it cleaves that SiO2 bond, and now you have SiOH. You have It's hydroxylated, and that's where uh, it just weakens at the surface, not in the bulk but always at the surface. Huh, that's so neat. And it's, again, something that you would not be able to see. I mean, you could, I guess so, technically, people say you can bench cool your glass. Even that's not even good for it, even if you've done a flame annealing. Yeah, I mean, the bench cooling is just a way to get it into a furnace safely, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and people also don't realize that when you anneal glass, uh, it's not a case of if a little's good, a little bit more is better. Because glass can then go into phase separation. You know, glass is kind of like, uh, oh, a cake ingredient, right? You got your bulk, which is the flour. That's silica. Then you've got your uh, flux, uh, the sugar that makes everything sweet and uh, melt stuff, and then you've got your modifiers that make things um, form and gel together quickly, uh, like an egg, and this otherwise um, boron. And what'll happen is, if you put this into the furnace at about 300 degrees C, your flux starts to become active, and it wants to break away from 
uh, the material. And, and that can actually start to leave the material at the surface. So if you start to mm. anneal glass too long, you can actually change the property of that glass. Yeah, I've learned that firsthand experience, with, especially with now with certain colors that are being introduced that I'm not used to using and letting them go through too many cycles. Yeah, or, or sitting, they're ex you know? yeah because for, for color, you're using phase separation to allow that network uh, to form so it can block light or block a spectrum of light and reflect back red, for instance, on a striking color. Okay. That's so neat. So... Yeah, you okay. really get into the material when you're doing the scientific glass because you have to, it has, there are so many uh, factors when it comes into application for that, just uh, whether it'll hold in helium, you know? Yeah. Uh, helium is a small molecule and will work its way through most glasses uh, fairly quickly. Oh, that's yeah. That, that's, again, I love that part of the glass. Is the there's so many different things you can do with it application wise, but having to know the certain glass to use for those certain applications. Yeah, and if not, they they know uh, that if they add in a little bit of this, a little bit of that, they can actually tailor make a glass for uh, um, a application and do all the designing now on software. And just say, okay, it's going to be, it's going to have this thermal expansion, and it will have this dielectric property. The Young's modulus will be such and such, and um, so it's really become far more advanced. Yeah, it's neat. I never thought about that before. It makes total sense, though. Sure. Yeah. I sense. mean, it's just, uh, it's like uh, anything else in great cooking, right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. So, and I guess to kind of go through the process of learning the scientific application on a lathe, you know, for instance, which is probably, I guess, all you guys do is it's all it's all lathe work. Um, but the be but the beginning of it, when you're learning the joints and the different welds and the T joints and everything else, what how does that process begin? The teaching process is it like learning just oh. one specific tedious bullshit detail at a time, or do they should take it through the whole process and then break it down? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you want to do it now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, when you when, when I started out, uh, it would be a long time before you got onto a lathe. Okay. Um, you pulled points. You pulled points and you pulled points. And it was almost like boot camp because they would just uh, say this is, you know, you'd have a table full of points and then just they'd say, okay. Uh, throw these out and I'll pull some real points. <laughs> yep. You know? That's how I teach it. <laughs> yeah. And, it, and it's mostly, you know, just like, uh, oh, any kind of hazing. They want to see if you can stick through it, whether you're going to quit now. And, and you now's a good a time to find out as, as later. Yeah, exactly. So there's a hazing period you went through. But then once you have your table full of points they would tell you to okay now make a bunch of bulbs now you found out oh boy this one's crooked this one is off weight this one is and you really started to learn to select your good points yeah yeah <laughs> after a while and even today uh i try to do as much work on the bench as i can uh, mostly because you can get stupid on a, on a lathe. Mm. Uh, by stupid, I mean in regards to your fire. You can all of a sudden forget all these real nuances uh, that are extremely important when you're working on the bench, you know? Mm -hmm. And you develop these tailor-made fires that only you can work with best. If you try to, you can take somebody else's sort of flame, right? But it, it's almost like your own autograph, that flame that you work with. Hmm. And one of the things I think 
people uh, run into when they take a class somewhere or they see something on YouTube is they try to tune that fire just like, you know, Micah Evans had or Kiva Ford or, or myself. And they just cannot get anywhere. And it's basically because the more advanced you are, the hotter you're working. Yeah, it makes sense. And when you're working and you're not advanced enough, uh, things go into chaos far too quickly. We don't, you always see that uh, guy starting out, the apprentice or whatever, and they are just in the fire and disaster is happening and they're still in the fire mm -hmm. trying yep. to figure it out and it takes them a while but eventually you'll see you're always trying to get on that verge of chaos but also know how to bring it draw it back yeah okay and you can only do that learn that technique i think on a bench you can't really learn it on the lathe because it just uh you just get into a habit of working hard fast and hot all the time yeah and having that kind of perpendicular and vertical presence you know going on with the flame and the you know according to the glass and the you know locked into a machine you know the difference where you can move your arms around and get different angles and get glass flow you know to actually learn the material yeah, you know, because yeah. like you're saying, like I know, I like when I teach it, I I loved, I love the the new student to come in, and then they're intimidated as hell just by the idea of what they're gonna do, and then they actually melt the glass, and it's even more intimidating. But I'm just like, make a blob of glass. I don't care what it looks like. Just get used to your flame, your glass, and if you start losing control, take it out of the flame, but keep the glass moving, type of thing. And yeah. they don't, but they don't grasp that at first until they start to realize when they have this pile of shit they've made, they don't realize what they've done. But then they do it again. They realized everything that they've done. It all kind of makes more sense, you know. And it's, yeah. You know, it's, nothing it's teaches neat. you like failure. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> yeah, and that's why a lot of times, like, I like I don't mind holding you know a student's hand, but I prefer to like show them a demo, get them on there, and then walk away, and then come back and be like, hey, how's it going? And then maybe I grab an arm, angle, whatever. But again, oh, like absolutely. you're saying, you know, but it, it's all about like the the trial by fire. I mean, literally for us, the sense it is trial by fire because you like you're saying, I the, the idea of the flame is that the glass it's used to manipulate the glass to get it hot enough to then manipulate the glass, and yeah. you know that's all you need the flame for. If you want to melt the shit out of it and make soup, fine, go for it. But I want to get it just soft enough to make a, a wine glass, you know, or something of that nature. We're on a yeah. you know on a lathe like you're saying, it's full bore. You know, you're, you're, you know, chucks are spinning, your flames blowing, your blow hose is on, you're ready to go. Yeah, you're just thinking about the proc product, not the process, because yeah. so much of that process is taken out of your hands. Yeah, exactly. And you're, you're detached from it. You know, one of the things uh, that always drove me mad when I was uh, uh, an apprentice was, you know, you, you're doing a job and you're learning it for the first time. You're shown a procedure, you do something, and it just gets screwed up, right? So you call the the you know the boss over and, and you say, uh, "Look, uh, this happened. I'm not sure what happened." Well, the first thing they do is try to salvage the piece, mm -hmm. and then they walk away and say, "You know, try it again." Well, all you've been instructed on is how to deal with uh, an imperfect procedure that you've perfected. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And you're like scratching your head. So that was always uh, driving me nuts because so many of my uh, teachers back then were so advanced that they could... It, it would be like them talking trigonometry uh, to me, I would think. Right. Or, or it was so ingrained that they could no longer interpret how I could possibly screw up. 
right? <laughs> <laughs> or why you screwed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Trying to regress. Yeah. You know, and, it's, and that's a good point because I know myself, you know, the, it's, it's, I always learn more when I teach, you know, no matter what I'm doing. So I, I, that's one of the reasons I enjoy teaching as well because it always brings me back to the beginning. And recently I've had a new student and I've had to like relearn how to reteach again. That what, what did I do through the process, you know? So I've been writing a lot of things down and keeping more of a journal of it. But yeah, it's, it's important. You have it, to deconstruct. Yeah, it's important. And get under the hood and really uh, get introspective about what you're doing so you can interpret that. And yeah. one of the great things, you know, uh, I learned too when I when I got involved in the ASGS was writing uh, things and to present uh, uh, workshops and, and demos uh, in a lucid or at least uh translatable fashion for for other people uh, you actually have to uh do an analysis of yourself and through that process you learn quite a bit uh what you've been doing intuitively for too long yeah yeah absolutely and the intuitively part i agree that's and I, you know i find that being said uh, when i teach women how to do glass it always seems like they pick it up a little bit quicker because they have this natural intuition, you know, where like a man doesn't want to read even read instructions, but a female will sit there and like intuitively understand the material almost right away, you know. Yeah, and there's way. there's I mean we we get in a car we don't even want to know how to read a map. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. we just keep driving. Yeah. Uh, and we're we're gonna try and find that solution for ourselves. Oh. Uh, uh, some of the best glass blowers I've seen are, are women. Sally Prosh is an incredible uh, glass blower. Karen Lamont, an incredible artist. Uh, Downey Hatz does uh, great work. I mean, I go down the line. Yeah. Uh, and they're underappreciated sometimes, too. You know? Yeah, it's amazing. I know what you mean. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's it's and it's kind of neat with the with the glass and the pipe industry too. Like the the up and coming female presence is getting more and more and more. Like where it went from them having like female competitions to where like they're all just everybody's competing against each other because their level is th that good and it's respected now as that being a level of that you know that that type of technique. Yeah, so, yeah, that's yeah. yeah. pretty nice shit. So uh, yeah, man. So so what kind of uh, current projects are you working on? If you're able to talk about it. Well, right now, uh, doing a lot of work with dark uh, matter, dark energy experiments with the super sil, um, diffused silica. Um, and we're doing uh, some work in the atomic group on these ultra, ultra sensitive, uh, uh, like magnetometers and atomic clocks. And it's it's challenging the i mean the stuff i'm working on is so so thin in in this uh in the atomic area trying to create very miniaturized prototypes for uh this new kind of magnetometry uh called surf magnetometers and what it could enable to do us to do for instance is to have handheld mris oh wow instead of going into a tunnel uh you could just have something as small as uh a pointer uh in in the hands of the physician pinpointing different areas of the bodies and scoping uh to get imaging uh that way and you wouldn't need superconducting uh magnets you wouldn't need liquid helium to keep those superconducting magnets uh, functional. You wouldn't need uh, all of that shielding as well. And in fact, if you took that kind of uh, technology, there's a level of sensitivity called a, a Tesla. And that can get down to about 10 to the minus 15 Tesla. It's called uh, squid as to how they measure uh, using liquid helium super, superconducting uh, materials. Uh, after that, you get all this noise because it starts reading 
all the surrounding materials around it. With this new technology, what you do is you create uh, atoms to act like little gyroscopes, okay, with a laser. And these atoms are spinning like gyroscopes. If you introduce uh, any kind of field with an electromagnetic background at all, no matter how discreet, these gyroscopes will start to wobble. And from another laser, they can see that wobble because it will shift the, the, the wavelength of the light. And so at 10 to the minus 15, that's the present technology using uh, enormous amounts of energy and enormous amounts of resources that are finite. With this new technology, using nothing more than uh, glass cubes and something very small, this can get down to 10 to the minus 22 sensitivity on, on the uh, Tesla. So that's well over a million times more sensitive than present technology. Wow. Damn. And, yeah. And it's pretty amazing. Um, and with this other stuff that we're doing, we're trying to create uh, single crystals. We're growing these crystals in very, very pure uh, ampules made out of... Uh, synthetically fused uh, silica and it's uh, it's very challenging because we want parts per trillion pure <clears throat> and you have to get down to about 800 to a uh, thousand degrees to get this crystal to form and it's basically sodium and iodine uh, which, by the way, is a controlled substance. You have to buy it from the FDA. Interesting. Uh, yeah, in fact, I guess it's used to make speed. Huh. Uh, we're growing it so we can detect uh, radiation through uh, a process called scintillation. Huh. And um, it's really challenging because the ampules have to be extremely pure. They have to be out of something that wants to react with uh, sodium in a bad way. All glasses do. And uh, so we've got a process going where we coat that inside with uh, ultra pure uh, graphite. And it uh, manages not to affect the material of the property of the crystal that we're trying to grow and uh, can be removed from the ampule. Um, and we're getting help on that from uh, this company up in uh, Canada called Sandfire. They've been a great help on that. Fascinating. Is it like a powdered graphite or is it liquid? It, it's what they do, and it's no big secret. Uh, you put in... Uh, Oh, any kind of polar solvent or, or even uh, propane. Okay. Uh, but ultra pure uh, sources like that. And if you can get that into a controlled atmosphere and heat that uh, carbon atom up to about 1,000 degrees centigrade, you crack open uh, that carbon molecule and it just sticks onto the glass uh, surface and bonds to it uh, permanently. Oh, interesting. Although you can easily remove it by just uh, heating it from the out, heating it with a torch, but having it in an open atmosphere. But if there's nowhere for that uh, carbon molecule to escape, it will bond to that surface and stick on. Huh, that's interesting because I know there's been times where I've used cork as like a stopper and the cork's, yeah. the cork's like caught on fire, you know, and like left this smoke in the glass, which then became part of the glass. Like I couldn't get it out of the glass. 
Right, and, and then like you the, try heating it, and, and it, it makes it just, worse. It makes it worse. Yeah. You've actually cracked the carpet. Oh, yeah. interesting. That makes total sense. Uh, you know, because it, it's. I, I'm uh, sure somebody screwed up and came up with that. Yeah, and <laughs> found out a good application for it. This, yeah, you know? hell yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Yeah, it makes total yeah. sense though. Now that I see that, because it's it's cool. Because like I see like graphite tape and things that are used on lathe work, or you know, between joints, or you know, what have you, to make sure things don't stick, and. uh Having that graphite layer in there, it makes total sense that it won't bond a lot of any kind of bonding to the surface of the glass. Well, and graphite is extremely inert, so it won't affect the properties of other huh. materials, too. That makes sense. You know? So it's kind of a neutral kind of thing. Yeah. And because we can control the purity of the starting material, get it ultra, ultra pure, we can control any kind of uh, contamination. Huh. that it may impart uh, as we grow the crystal. And, and how a crystal grows now is just uh, something I'm learning about, and it's just uh, a fascinating process. I mean, it's diametrically different than a, than a glass property because you actually start to cook this in stages. You're moving the furnace up slowly, uh, in what we call a zone for furnace uh, so we can grow the crystal down at one area and start to nucleate this growth of crystals that are in perfect structure of order as it grows so it can uh, direct light in or energy in in very specific directions glass is random so uh it has the wonderful ability of light to just uh kind of disperse it in in a very good pattern where crystals also have the ability to be birefringent so they can direct light in a very specific pattern interesting so instead of using a mirror you can use a crystal to kind of redirect a emotion of light yeah, or to just pick up the, the specific footprint of how these photons are traveling. Okay. Uh, and use it as a scintillator that way. Huh. So neat. It's almost creating like something almost perfect and pure. That yeah, way. and we, it, this, I mean, we have to measure its purity down to. Uh, you know, parts per trillion, which is another uh, part of the experiment that we have to do. So now we want to be able to accurately measure any kind of radiation when we're dealing with trying to uh, probe all this uh, stuff that's out there in the universe. If we took every element, every planet, everything that we've ever been able to measure up to date it still only comes to about four percent of the universe yeah. there's all this other stuff out there that we cannot uh directly measure huh. uh and we have to come up with elaborate ways of uh finding out we know it's out there uh, because of its effect on gravity. Yeah, and like the whole the whole gravity wave, you know, idea now that they yeah. will actually prove was real. You know, so it's so fascinating. <laughs> you know, every day I, I post on Facebook some new discovery being made in glass or with glass, and uh, it, it it I never run out of uh, new stuff. Uh, sometimes it's multiple stuff, and it's uh, it's just fascinating for yeah. me to to go through it. You know. Yeah, you wonder if like the Teslas and Edison's and Einstein even himself, if they were around nowadays with our technology and the glass, like you're saying, like the way that you can change chemistry of the glass to go to whatever you needed to be, you know, catered to your needs. Like what the hell these guys would be coming up with nowadays, you know? Oh they yeah, might blow the earth up or some shit. How did <laughs> you know? Einstein figure out quantum waves? I know that's what I was thinking the other day. We were watching it on the news. And they were talking about it. It's like I can yeah. understand like throwing a rock in a in, a, in the water and it creates ripples. I I can understand the theory and thinking that, but but 
to come up with an, even a mathematical equation to prove it or, you know, in theory, prove it, you know. It's, well, it's, and, and to, to get into any concept of time as a fabric. Mm-hmm. And he totally uh, uh, gave a new way of looking at gravity. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just, uh, it's amazing. Of course, we wouldn't be where we are today without Einstein or Tesla. So, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, it's all if, uh, ands and buts, uh, when you come to that, but you know, we always say in, uh, you know, research, the, all the easy stuff's been done before. <laughs> That's the problem. Right. You know? Yeah, now it's reinventing the wheel over and over yeah. and over again. Damn, I <laughs> wish I could have done that. I had that figured out. Yeah, you know? shit. <laughs> oh, that's so fucking cool. I used to be like, I, I could talk to you all night on this stuff, man. It's so killer. You know, and I want to. I definitely we had talked uh, last week. I definitely want to bring you back and do like a a MythBuster show, and really kind of you know get some yeah. of these concepts and ideas that are just thrown around randomly to. Uh, like, you know, one of our kind of a side thing here, one of our terms that have been thrown around and used forever by the customer in the, sh- the smoke shops is the whole double blown concept, you know, based on how thick a pipe is. They're like, oh, this thing's been double blown. Do you ever do does people ever use that terminology or is that word in your landscape of science? I glass? hear, boy, I hear so much terminology that just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, uh, I only recently found out a gong was a standard tapered joint. Yeah. Uh, I still not sure totally what in callment, encasement, uh, all of these other uh, uh, sor- sources of, uh, of terms. And I'm sure I've done these, but I'm just calling it uh, lamination or something else you know yeah and, for sure you know i think a lot of our terminology that's thrown around and used is comes from like the venice days and those you know the more of the art side where you guys because of scientific application you're you're using more scientific terms which in all reality have a better definition of what the actual technique is compared to like you know yeah you know. or i i don't know i mean why is a maria called a maria i've asked that same fucking thing dude for 15 yeah. years yeah. Exactly. I was. Yeah. I've been making these flower bases at Disney the past week, and I'm like, yeah. I, and I put a Maria in the piece just for something different. And yeah. I, I was explaining that to a girl the other day. I was like, yeah, this is called a Maria. And she's like, why is that? I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> I've been well, trying to and, find this out. <laughs> and I know, you know, sometimes you got to change things around. I mean, if you Google glory hole now, you're just yeah. going to get a nightmare. <laughs> exactly. We can't use that word at Disney because of that shit. We've got a, yeah. we've got a single yeah. guy, you know, in the back of the furnace, and he has to call it the reheat. You know? Yeah, when I, I, I'd go to Corning, and uh, there was a great little uh, bar pub called the Glory Hole. Oh, shit. And uh, I, I, I noticed all of a sudden it started to disappear, and it was called the gaffer. <laughs> Now, I guess people wanting to know where the glory hole were, were going to be disappointed one way or yeah. the other. Yeah, the bathrooms you know? are all closed now. Yeah, Sorry. yeah, no <laughs> holes in the wall. <laughs> oh, that is so funny. I know, it's, there's so much fallacy involved in glass blowing in general. I mean, just the... You know, every time I make an, I make Olaf, the little snowman... You had to say fallacy? Yeah, it's, but it's true, man. Like, it's, it's like... Everybody, I, I've, I've been literally, I've been asked by a girl while I'm on stage at Disney making Olaf if I was making a penis. She's like, "You making a penis?" And I was like, "Yeah, actually, I am." And, yeah. I said, and then there's like nobody in the store, so I was able to say this to her and that response. Normally, I would get probably fired, but you know, yeah. but it's so you know, it's so funny the just the perverted, according to modern society, you know, whatever terminology that oh, we use. Yeah. You know, yeah, the looks, I, the t- you know, it's just I love it. That just makes me I, laugh. I have a funny story. Uh... There was this breakthrough we made, and and we're going to we're trying to make something for the cover of Nature. Now, Nature is the most prestigious journal there is in science. It's like uh, the Academy Award. You get published in Nature. Uh, you're going back almost to the time of uh, Newton. Oh wow! So um, we had found a way to do imaging with MRI using uh noble gases so 
I don't won't go into the to it too much, but where they the, the key gas was xenon. So we did this experiment, and we had this tiny little cell. Now they wanted to have me make something that would fit inside no nothing bigger than say the size of a quarter hmm. in a sphere, and it had to uh, be something about the technology and uh they said anything you can think of so i i proposed that i would do xe in like a three-dimensional uh figure as a model you know the the element for xenon is xe okay yeah and it i'd make a xenon uh model so i i go back and they say yeah, okay, but try something that everybody would recognize as well, too. So I go back and I put this uh, XE together. I take very small, you know, slides and I cut them and, and make this, you know, uh, font of X, capital X and E, and I mount it inside this spherical cell. And then I take... Uh, uh, a penis uh, model and it's you know got foreskin and uh, the the jewels at the bottom and even a little pubic hair and I put that inside this little sphere and I call it the heart on <laughs> so <laughs> so I go back to the professor and I go here's the heart on so and, you know, I don't think he heard it. I kind of mumbled it. And uh -huh. I gave it to him. And he looks at this raging penis inside the cell. <laughs> <laughs> and I quickly gave him the real copy. You know? <laughs> so about uh, two years later, I'm, I'm actually at Los Alamos and uh, meeting with some people. And I'm talking to this one uh, professor and they're talking about some coatings and stuff. And uh, she's introduced to me. Uh, and you're the glass blower at Princeton, aren't you? And I said, yeah, you're the one who made that hard on cell. <laughs> 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 I guess it made the whole round uh, secretly. Oh, man. And that uh, must have been pretty damn small, though, too, huh? Well, yeah, yeah, I've heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> oh shit that's too funny though i mean yeah it's, it's uh just think of that just the application to actually create that that's kind of pretty funny stuff but just in general man that is too funny it's it's yeah it's amazing how yeah fast you would around. think there would be much uh wooden sticks that you're working with uh, uh -huh. man there are some hilarious people uh that i work with that are just a uh, 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 joy to be around yeah that's and cool just brilliant too hell yeah you know? I guess the wife has officially gotten home. All right, let's get done barking here a sec. Hey, baby. That sounds like a big hound. Yeah, he's a uh, husky Aussie mix. Oh, okay. So yeah, he's a cool dog. He's got the the bright blue eyes and a great temperament. Yeah. I think we have. He has a little yeah. bit of lab in him too. But, oh. But yeah, he's a killer dog. A really, really like super awesome. Probably the best dog I've ever had. Oh, so yeah. good. Yeah. So, mm. I guess kind of, I'll, I'll kind of move forward here. How's you, how are you holding up physically from the forty years of the glass? Oh, my eyes are what I miss the most. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm getting to either tighter and tighter detail. You know, um, some of the tolerances I have are plus or minus uh, twenty micron. Now. If you take the average thickness of a human hair, it's 100 micron. Jeez, yeah. <laughs> and I have to blow these spheres uh, with a wall thickness of exactly uh, 120 micron plus or 20, plus or minus 20 micron. Wow. And, uh, and it's out of this aluminum silicate. So how do you gauge something like that, like when you're actually blowing it out? It's mostly uh, farming, 
you know, or kind of like playing um, uh, landmine, uh -huh. where you, you know, you blow it a little thick. Uh, you try to blow them all consistently, right? Right. It's, and then you measure them, uh, and you have to measure them. It's very difficult because any temperature fluctuation uh, will throw off your measurements. Uh, so you measure them. And then if it's a little thick, you can kind of re-blow it thinner, you know, a uh -huh. little bit bigger, uh, pull off some material, try again. Uh, but you only have two chances yeah. at this because <clears throat> what makes this uh, torturous is they want the thinnest material possible to hold in the most amount of gas as possible. Hmm. So it's like trying to to get into heaven without dying, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, you know, glass is not like uh, paper with an ignition point or any kind of point. They're all ranges. So about once I make a bunch of these, then they're all pressure tested to almost 300 PSI. And bear in mind, it's only... A hundred, a little bit thicker than a hair, mm. 120 micron wow. thick, about one inch in diameter. And uh, it has to take 300 PSI uh, for a period of uh, a half hour. Wow. And about 50% of the ones that I get in range explode. <laughs> and you'd say, well, why is that? Well, because we're right at, we're way over the borderline on what it would be. And trust me, if a hundred percent of them, uh, you know, pass the test, the pressure test, they would go thinner until 50% of them would fail. Yeah, totally. I can see that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, and it's just, uh, some days you have a good day. <laughs> Some days you don't, but we found that if if we measured something that had been blown more than twice, it had no chance of surviving any pressure test. If you blow it once, you'll get about 60% yield. If you blow it the second time, about 20% will be in there. Uh, Any time after that, zero. Interesting. Is that because you're... The act of moving the glass twice, like, does something to the molecular structure of it? Yeah, every time you uh, put, you know, glass in a fire and you get it into its melting point, it can uh, start to lose some of its uh, materials just uh, as they boil away. You see it when you work Pyrex. You'll see, you know, that gray ghost in cooler areas. That's the sodium uh starting to boil out and uh recondense in cooler spots you see it in the flame right when yeah. it's yellow yeah. that sodium is uh is not on the glass anymore it's in the flame hmm. you yeah, know it makes so sense, huh? um you can start to uh, break away that glass anytime you do a fire cut you know and you put two pieces of glass uh, that have been fire cut and you put them together. If you look at it in the pleroscope, you'll see a fine line because that edge that you did the fire cut uh, is is going to be slightly different material. Hmm. Fascinating. But again, makes total sense to me at least. Yeah, makes yeah I mean, so glass is strange. Uh, yeah, it is. It's it's a perfect uh, insulator against electrical uh, properties, right? Mm -hmm. But as you start to raise its temperature, it becomes more and more conductive. Hmm. Till you, one of the neat experiments you'll see is you take a, a glass bottle, right, and you warm it up a little bit in a torch, uh, and then you put it in the microwave. And you set that microwave for five, ten minutes. That microwave will melt uh, the glass hmm. because you've gotten that 
uh, temperature up. So now when those atoms vibrate, they're going to collide against each other uh, more often and cause the heat to pass. When they do a furnace melt, uh, it goes from, you know, a fired charge to where the, as it becomes liquid in a, in a float process, there's these big elect electrodes that go right into the molten glass and it's, it's an electrical charge and the glass is part of the element that's heating it up to melt itself. Huh. Wow. Yeah. That's so weird. <laughs> it's just an amazing, amazing material. I know it is. I love it. <laughs> I mean, you can inflate it, stretch it. Uh, I, I work a lot with this guy in the optics department. We're doing a lot of anionic bonding, bonding uh, Pyrex to silicon chips. And, uh, and he has to put on... Uh, uh, these uh, lenses and stuff on, on the work and he has to grind and polish and he only has one direction it's subtractive if he goes a little bit too far if he gets a scratch he's screwed hmm. and me I can add to it uh, you know shrink it expand it and this poor son of a bitch you know <laughs> yeah Jesus <laughs> It's like uh, working with the toughest wife in the world. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, that's crazy. Yeah. So, yeah. so your eyes are getting. Are you are you finding cataract stuff issues or just just a? Uh... No, I'm getting more and more uh, farsighted. Okay. You know, so I have to work. Uh, you know, really close. Uh, I just recently did a job where uh, they gave me a. Uh, a rectangular tube that was a half millimeter ID by one millimeter OD. Jeez. And it was uh, five millimeters wide. So it was like, uh, you know, heating up paper. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> and I have to tubulate it uh, to, uh, you know, three millimeter uh, heavy wall tube. So you and, have to actually condense it down? Yeah, what I came up with, uh, I mean, I tried all kinds of things. It's got this uh, silicon chip uh, welded to it. And that silicon chip is actually kind of a cell. It, 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 it's like a cup, a little miniature cup that sits over a little hole that we've drilled on this strip of rectangular thin wall tubing. Okay, and now we need to get gases in there and then seal it off, and we want it as short as possible. But to get that on there, we got to get onto a vacuum system, put a stem on it, just like you would see on any kind of vacuum tube, right? Mm -hmm. Your bulbs, for instance. Um, so I took a, a graphite, uh, or I took a tungsten, and I shaped it into kind of a, uh, a, a thin point with a slight arrow, you know, slight hex to it, right? And I can just barely get the tip of that into that little half millimeter slot on this thin wall stuff. So if I put the fire onto the tungsten, that tungsten then transfers the heat onto the glass. I don't even have to put it in the fire, and it just slumps and forms around uh, the tungsten wow. if I keep twirling it uh, if I get it too hot it'll stick and it's a mess but uh, otherwise there's just no way you can blow through it uh, until you get uh, a blow tube on it huh. you know what I mean yeah yeah <laughs> and then once you get that on uh, but figuring that out just took uh, uh, some time yeah not yeah. having the losing your your far side oh, of this thing, yeah, not be able to see it. And you gotta have, you gotta be up so close to see anything, and you've got your uh, uh, didymium to work with, and uh, oh, it's, it was just, uh. yeah, time for some prescriptions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh.
No. How, how's your how's your wrist and your arms and stuff and any carpal tunnel issues or tendonitis or any of that stuff? Arthritis? No, no. I mean, really, I I worked a heck of a lot harder when when I was uh, in the industry. Yeah. Uh, younger. I mean, uh. You, we used to work really, really, really big stuff, 24 inch diameter uh, stuff. And uh, that's that's a whole different technique in itself, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, had to work a lot of quartz as well. Here, it's it's uh, more one at a time and trying to uh, problem solve uh, some issues. Um, so, uh, it satisfies my intellectual curiosity and goes well with my, uh, lack of any kind of, uh, of work ethic so far as working hard goes <laughs> anymore. You know what right, I mean? Yeah. I mean, the old joke is you go to work at a university to, to get away from glass blowing. Uh, <laughs> <Funny. laughs> but, uh. No, it, it's um, it, it's it's a lot of fun, and it and it's just um, you know it it it, it, it you're always learning uh, something new uh, there, and uh, and it's it I'm I'm just blessed to be working uh, where I am. Yeah, man, it's awesome opportunity for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's cool. just. And it just seems improbable because, I mean, you, uh, I, I, I don't have an advanced degree. Uh, I started working when I was, uh, you know, 17 as an apprentice. And uh, now I'm at Princeton University. I, it wasn't by design. It was just by being in the right place at the right time. And when it falls in, you just do the best you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's taking those doors that open up and opportunities, and but also having some drive just to walk through the doors. Yeah, yeah it, it's, uh, you know, like Yogi Berra uh, said, uh, the the harder I try, the luckier I get. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, and, and it just, um, I, to anybody out there, I would just say, you know, just keep, plugging away you never know how something adverse can actually when you look back in your life could have been the best thing that ever happened to you uh yeah you know yep, it's, absolutely it's funny that way yeah and how sometimes you can get trapped into this honey pot where you get too comfortable and life can just pass you by and boom you're 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 stuck, uh, and now you're 40, 50 years old saying, how did I get here? Yeah, man, it goes by fast. I'll be 40 this year myself, and it's like <laughs> 17 years on the torch even sounds like, holy shit, 17 years. I got people yeah. talking to me about this stuff or just getting started that are 17, you know, now it is. Well, you know, as you get older, you always think you're the same age, right? Yeah, totally. <laughs> you know, and you just, you, then you start seeing, oh, uh, Holy Christ, Jack Nicholson looks like, uh, you know, a corpse. Yeah, right. Uh, and then I realized I'm the same way or getting there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. all your heroes are, are just suddenly, you know, limping and yeah. uh, uh, very fragile. And, and uh, you you start spouting all the shit your dad said. You know, I don't yep. pay the electric company. You know, uh, can't you turn off a freaking light yep. uh, all this <laughs> stuff at your kids and just uh, uh yeah that's funny <laughs> shit man well hey brother i gotta i gotta uh kind of wrap this up here for all of us yeah um only because my computer's about to die and it's Ugh. uh yeah mm -hmm. well so I, like i said man i could talk to you for hours and days but what I want to do is bring you back on uh, closer to May when we kind of get more into the symposium and then do a little uh, kind of a QA and a Mythbuster show. I think it'd be a lot of fun to to kind of lead us all into to me why this is so important that the symposium is happening and also that this foundation exists. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I think it'd be and a lot of fun to if you this. get a um, if you get into the that YouTube and uh, to videotape uh, 
some of the things you'll see you'll yeah. see some uh, amazing uh uh work there yeah absolutely oh yeah we'll be doing some doing some video recording at least i'll be doing some video recording i should say and i'm also yeah. gonna take advantage of do some interviews while i'm there too i'm gonna try and contact some other folks that are gonna be there and yeah uh, you gotta yeah. talk to kiva ford and yeah. uh you know uh tim dreyer's great guy um you know i i've just been blessed uh because i really was very orthodox so far as art glass went for most of my career and but for the influences of people like sally prash paul stankard dennis brining and all and so many others i just uh got such a deep appreciation uh for all uh the artistic glass out there Heck you yeah. know yeah that's awesome Hell yeah, man. Well, before we let you go, if you want to give us uh, any kind of parting piece of advice to anybody getting started that's even just been in the industry forever, and then also how we can uh, go about finding you out there in cyberspace. Uh, yeah, I, I would just say, um, you know, if you're doing flame work, and it, know the flame. It's like uh, uh, Fight Club, you know, the first rule about uh, flame working is know the flame. The second uh, rule is know the flame. And if you really start thinking about it as being three-dimensional, there's a top, bottom, center to it. There's a heat zone. And even things such uh, as nuance as the velocity, how much uh, pressure and flow you're getting uh, can affect it. Uh, and just always experiment. Check, change sizes and stuff. Don't get... Uh, uh, you know, casual about the flame. Be very exquisite about it. And I think you'll be uh, a, a much better uh, glass blower. Yeah, that's well said. Absolutely. And uh, what's your Facebook page? Oh, I've got, a, you know, a little personal Facebook. But most of my uh, time is spent running the uh, American Scientific Glass Blowers okay. Facebook page. And if you look for them... Uh, oh, we've got hundreds of uh, short little videos showing stuff like the famous Jesus seal uh, <laughs> and, and other uh, techniques um, and a lot of information. The only um, we just uh, spend most of that just exposing people about uh, glass as a material whether it's art science or whatever it's it's has to do with glass awesome hell yeah well we love it man and love having you on and again i'm gonna get you back on here uh probably about i guess this is almost march now so probably next month we'll get back get you back on and talk about the symposium what's going on there and then get into some myth busting and get us all on the right path to being uh experts in our field yeah and if anybody has a question or had a problem toss them in maybe we can try and problem solve some of those yeah, things yeah absolutely you. yeah i'll be putting that out there for sure heck yeah man well again i appreciate you taking some time off on your sunday man it's uh, been a pleasure having you on and we look forward to having you on next month hey it's been a joy and i i, I had a chance to look to listen to some of your other podcasts and uh boy it's just been fun awesome man I'm, I, I'm looking forward to going through some of the library yeah i appreciate that yeah i would love some feedback from you too anything i say wrong that's not right not true let me know because i will correct it <laughs> So. Oh, we'll just start rumors. Hey, perfect. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> awesome, brother. We'll have a beautiful night, man. We'll talk to you soon. All right, Jason. Take care. Yeah, my take care. Bye-bye. Thank you guys so much for listening to this episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show. If you have any questions, comments, or remarks, please leave them in the show notes page area where it says comments. We'll see you soon. Have a wise night.